Well, good morning, church family, and Shabbat Shalom. God willing and the creek don't rise, <clears throat> this would be the last Sabbath that I have to spend in quarantine. I'm looking forward to, to doing my sermons live in church there. Uh, Susan is doing a bit better, and I expect she'll continue to progress through the next week or so. Thank you so much for your continued prayers. Whether she really had COVID or not, uh, it was pretty tough to watch her go through it. And I praise God for his mercy and for the prayers of our church family. Thank you. My sermon today is called Hearses and U-Haul Trailers. I remember as a kid uh, being in the car with my dad, we were stopped at a light and a funeral procession w went by. And my dad noted, he said, hey, you notice there isn't any U-Haul trailer behind that hearse. And I didn't really know what he was talking about. And he asked me why I thought that was, and I told him I had no idea. And he said, because you can't take it with you. Well, in 1990, James Patterson and Peter Kim, a couple uh, psychologists, authors, <clears throat> they wrote a book uh, based on an extensive survey of the American public. The book was called The Day That America Told the Truth. It's really a fascinating book. Uh, questions were asked concerning a wide range of topics from morality to work, to family life, and the results, some of them were quite surprising. One of the questions was, or, or a series of the questions was, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? And then they followed up and said, well, what would you be willing to do for $5 million, or $4 million, or $3 million, or $2 million? And the results remained fairly consistent. It was only when they got under $2 million that um, they began to see a fall off in what people would do. So it would appear that the price for many Americans to violate their principles, to go against their values, was $2 million. So out of the 10 questions they asked, um, two thirds of the respondents agreed they would be willing to do at least one and some uh, several, and some several of the, the following deeds. What were they? 25% said they would abandon their family and 25% said they would also abandon their church. Wow. 23% said they would become prostitutes for a week or more. 16% would give up their American citizen citizenship. But, and you know, the way things seem to be going today, I bet that number is probably double by now. 16% would leave their spouse. 10% would, would, would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. And even more disturbing, 7% said that for $2 million, 3, 4, 5, or $10 million, they would kill a stranger. 6% would change their race. 4% would have a sex change operation, although it doesn't really seem that you have to pay anyone to do that anymore these days, right? And maybe not as surprising, 3% said they would put their kids up for adoption. In Luke 12, 16 to 21, we read this. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. Look, I'm pretty sure that most of us believe that this is all coming to an end and probably pretty soon, that it's, this is all going to burn. What is it that keeps us hanging on to what we have for dear life? I, I believe that it's fear. It's fear of losing what we have or fear of not getting what we want or what we think we need. And that's what I want to explore this morning. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Hearses and U-Haul trailers or you can't take it with you. The verse uh, reading for this sermon today is Matthew 19, verses 21 to 22. It says, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that, when he heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What was his problem? Well, he, was, he had fear of giving up what he had not knowing what he was giving up, right? Which was a relationship with Jesus Christ, but giving up his personal possessions because he placed more value on those than he did on his relationship with God. 
I hope that's not what we do, but, but I believe that at times in our lives, we all go through that. I am the first one to admit that I have been in that place before. And um, um, it, it, takes, it takes, I think, some uh, effort to be able to come through those things. And sometimes we have to rely on our church brothers and sisters to help us when they see us uh, engaged in those types of struggles. That, that they come to us, we go to them, and we help them to come through the other side. Amen? Let's have prayer. Oh, Lord, we're so grateful for this Sabbath day, for the opportunity to come to church today and, and to get out of the middle of all this chaos and this insanity that's going on around us on a daily basis, Lord. I'm so grateful for your mercy, the mercy you've had for Susan, Lord, and she's been sick, and I... I'm very grateful and praise you that your grace is sufficient for today. Now, as we go about our day, we have this sermon, Lord. I would ask that it would be your words and not mine that are spoken today, that the Holy Spirit would open each of our hearts to hear whatever portion of this message we need to hear. I also pray for a hedge of angels about this place that would keep us safe while we have our worship service today. And I pray all this in the precious name of Yeshua. Amen. So I talked about in the introduction that it's my opinion, I believe, that much of what causes us to experience this, um, um, these feelings, right, is fear. Uh, and we talked about the different types. Well, let's, let's examine those one at a time. The first is fear of loss, right? In Matthew 16, 24 to 26, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, and follow me. For whatever desire, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Wow. And we're going to probably repeat this verse at least once more during this sermon. But look at the last verse. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And go back to the introduction and that book that was written about how people would, um, uh, 7% would actually kill a stranger, 25% would leave their family, 25% would leave their church, 16% would give up their citizenship. I mean, my goodness, uh, what is it that we're willing to do? What is it that the money gives us that is so, um, so incredibly important? Well, I gotta tell you, um, I believe that sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's an addiction, like drugs. You know, uh, I, I've seen people, they, will, they give up their children uh, for drugs. They give up, uh, I had a, a friend of mine actually one time who, uh, he just got really messed up. His mom died and, and he had been an addict for a while and he had been in recovery and he came back out of it. And I mean, he, he signed over his car um, to the drug dealer and he signed over um, his possessions to the drug dealer. And then eventually what he did was he signed over the home that his mother had left him to the drug dealer. I mean, you know, what will we give in exchange for our souls? And I would be willing to say that, that when we, we get into a state of fear or panic, that we really would be willing to give up anything. Abraham, he feared for his life, didn't he? It says in Genesis 21 to 2, and Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and he stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, Oh, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Well, why did Abraham say that Sarah was his sister? Now, first of all, it, it wasn't exactly a lie. You know, if you want to talk about stretching things a bit, uh, because Sarah was his half-sister, okay? And that's the way it was in, in those days. It was a different uh, genetic pool, I guess in those days and you didn't have the same types of issues that you have today. But he was afraid because she was so beautiful that if they thought that she was his wife, that they would kill him to take her. I mean, that's, that's just crazy, right? Um, and so he lied and, and he lied to the king and said that she is my sister. And so Abimelech, the king of Gerar sent and he took Sarah to be his own. In Genesis 20, 11, well, Abraham said, I figured this to be a godless place. They will want my wife and will kill me to get her. 
I thought, right? He's giving the reason and the excuse for it. Do you remember what, um, um, what happened uh, after that, what the situation was? When, when, when King um, uh, Abimelech found out about it, he was angry. He was angry with Abraham. Why? Because he said, hey, you almost caused me to sin against God, right? You almost caused me to violate my principles, uh, to sell my soul, if you will, for this woman, because she's married. And why didn't you tell me that, right? Um, Rebecca, she feared for her son in Genesis 27, 7 to 10. She says, now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, right? Little goats. And I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. Wow. I mean, we have this fear of want, right? We're not, I heard, um, I heard a speaker one time. He said, my wanter is broken. And I don't know the difference anymore between what I want and what I need. And I think that we need to get a handle on that for sure. Because a lot of times things we think we need are things that we, that we want. Because God has already given us everything that we need to make it through that day. His grace is sufficient for the day. Matthew 6, 31 to 34 says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. So what is, what, is, um, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, hey, wait a minute. Don't be like the unbelievers. They worry about this stuff all the time because they don't have a personal relationship with me. Why do they worry about what they're going to drink or what they're going to wear? Because they've spent their whole lives struggling to get what they're going to drink and what they're going to wear. But us, we are tied into Jesus Christ. We are tied to the creator of the universe. And we are promised and, 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 and guaranteed that we will have the things that we need. All we have to do is the next right thing. Just take the next step in the process. It says, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things, right? So it's not like a surprise. God knows that we need to drink. He knows that we need to be clothed. He knows that we need to have food and companionship for that matter too. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So let's, let's stop for a minute and first focus on our personal relationship with God. I mean, the Holy Spirit guides us and direct us, directs us in the things we do on a daily basis if we call upon him for that guidance and that direction. And as long as that's the case, we will always have the things that we need. So therefore, it says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day, is its own trouble. I used to think about this, about if I started uh, today and I started getting into yesterday, oh, what happened yesterday and starting to sort of rehash or relive that, or I get into tomorrow. And now, in addition to the troubles I have for today, I start creating the troubles that I might have or might not have for tomorrow. And it says that, you know, God's grace is sufficient uh, for one day. But if I start getting into yesterday and tomorrow, I don't know if there's enough grace to cover me anymore because the grace is for today. It says sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I got enough things to deal with today. Um, heaven forbid, I want to try and get myself into tomorrow already. Stop rehearsing the difficulties because what happens is if what you think is going to happen, the bad things come true, you'll have had to live through it twice. And if it doesn't come through, then you had to live through it once when you wouldn't have had to do it at all. Eve feared for not having it all, didn't she, right? Uh, the serpent convinced her that she was missing out on something that was really important. Genesis 3, 6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. What did God say? He, hey, you can have anything you want in this garden, but you can't touch, not just eat, you can't touch the fruit that is in the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of life. And, and Eve and, and Adam obeyed that until the serpent came along and told her the big lie. And she said, well, no, I can't touch that because God said that surely I'll die. And the serpent's like, well, there's a big lie. Surely you won't die. 
go ahead and try it and see. I'll show you. I guarantee you that you're not going to die. But at that time, they, I don't know if they were thinking about the idea of eternal life, that eventually they would die. Maybe it was this thought that if I bite that fruit, that I'm going to die immediately. And, and they didn't consider the words of Jesus, not, not, not their own thoughts or their interpretation about it, but Jesus' words himself, he said, you will surely die. Lot, he feared that he wasn't going to get the best of everything, right? It says, because um, remember, um, um, he was offered uh, him and Abram uh, portions of the land, and Lot kind of went first. And he says he lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. <clears throat> so Lot took the pick of the litter. He took the best of the best. And they separated from each other. And Abram, his land wasn't so rich and it wasn't so fertile. It says he dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. You know, there was this story I saw one time about um, this uh, kid who always had to have the biggest slice and the biggest piece and the biggest everything. And one time, you know, the <clears throat> it was apples or some fruit out there and he went in first and he knocked everybody out of the way and grabbed the biggest one and he bit into it and it was rotten. And, and he wanted to go back and exchange it for another piece of fruit, but it was too late because all the others had been accounted for. You know, Jesus tells us that he who is first will be last in the kingdom of heaven. And I think that is what he's talking about. Jacob, he feared for the future, didn't he? In Genesis 30, 41 to 43, it says, and it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. You know, I, I wish I had time to really get into this, but this was... This was genetic engineering that went on in those days. If you remember that um, Jacob also had the rods that were striped and they weren't striped. And if, um, if when the, the um, sheep were breeding, if he put the striped rod in front of them, then they came out a certain color. And if he put the plain rod, or if he didn't put it in front of them, they came out another color, right? And, and he was building his share of the flock. And he was doing it, um, I'm not going to say illegally, but he was definitely gaming the system, right? Because he was afraid that he wasn't going to get enough of what he needed. And so he became exceedingly prosperous, it said, and he had large flocks. But he did it by, by engineering this and stealing from Laban. Now, whether we might think that it was right or wrong based on the promises that were made to him or based on the relationship that he had, that's irrelevant. Because God gives us an absolute law that says you shouldn't cheat people and steal from people, that it's wrong. I think that a fear of lack is another big problem that we have. We fear that we're not going to have um, all of the stuff that we want or need to have. Luke 12, 15 says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. I mean, raise your hand, guys, if you know someone who defines who they are by their possessions, right? By what they have. Because I know people that are like that. I really do. Um, greed killed Ananias and his wife. Think about this. Remember, that's when they, they, um, they withheld or they hid monies or, or um, assets that they had when it came time to give their tithes and offerings. In Acts 5, 1 to 6, it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So it would be um, um, it would be like if you sold a house and you were to offer to to, to offer tithes and offerings on it, and you got a hundred thousand for your house, but you said you only got fifty. You know, you had them sign the title differently. Maybe they gave you fifty in in a, in a payment somehow that was recorded and fifty in cash, so nobody knew about it. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart 
to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. Now, my question is, how did Peter know that? I mean, was Peter privy to the, to the transaction that occurred? Was there a record in the bank? Did he punch it in on the internet somewhere? Did he get a Facebook post on it? No, he knew because the Holy Spirit spoke to him because God in that form spoke to him and told him what was happening. While it remained, it said, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? What he said was, just don't give as much, but don't lie about it because you haven't lied to men, he said, you lied to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, hearing these words at that moment, he fell down and he breathed his last. He died at the moment. And so great fear, such great fear came upon all those who heard these things because they saw what happens when you lie to God. And the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and they buried him. I mean, have we done that? I don't know. I mean, we're not even going to talk about it. But it's something to think about. Um, when we when we do things like this, God knows it all. It, it's not like we can ever hide from God. It just doesn't happen that way. And so when we when when we withhold those things that are God's, um, He knows, and and there are consequences to that. Greed and fear killed Christ. Now, <clears throat> I want to stop there for a minute, and I want to address this issue. Um, nobody killed Jesus, not in my opinion. He willfully went to his death because he did so knowingly because that was his commission here on earth, was he took the burden of sin from all of us. If, if you want to blame someone for killing Jesus, well, we could all blame ourselves because it's our sins that he died for. If we had been sinless, the world had been sinless, and, and, and moving forward from his death, if everyone had been sinless from that time forward, there wouldn't have been a need for Jesus to die. But he willingly chose to go to his death because he loved us so much that God loved us so much that he was willing to give his only begotten son, Jesus, that each of us would have a promise of salvation, that each of us would have a promise that we weren't going to be lost. My, my uncle Jerry, who's passed away now, but he used to tell the story. We were at Thanksgiving one year, and he would tell a story about how when we grew up in a Jewish neighborhoods and in the Orthodox and Hasidic neighborhoods uh, down in Oak Park and Southfield, Michigan. And he would tell the story about how um, the, the Christian kids would come through the neighborhood sometime. He'd be outside or on his bike and they'd yell at him that he was Christ killer, Christ killer. You killed Christ, you know. And he said, I went home one day and, and I said to my parents, I said, who is this Jesus Christ guy that I was supposed to have killed? Because he didn't know anything about it. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus died. And, and, and I, I wholeheartedly choose to believe that that he went to that cross willingly because he loved me so much that he was willing to die to give me a chance for eternal life. John 12, 42 to 43 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Wow. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, but they couldn't say that because if they did, they would have lost their positions, they would have lost their popularity, they would have lost their favor to the Pharisees. And so they chose instead to remain silent. And they put the praise of the men above the praise of God. Matthew 26, 3 to 4 says, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the place of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. It goes on later to say that one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Wow. I mean, right, um, for $2 million, 25% um, uh, of people would be willing to give up their church, to leave their church. And, and what was it for Judas? What was he willing to do to leave his church? He did it for 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Look, nothing's new between what happened 
thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago, and, and what happened in 1990 in the book that was published. He betrayed God for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, for $10 million, 7% of the population, or all the way down to 2 million, would be willing to kill a stranger. Wow. And, and he was willing to kill someone that wasn't a stranger, that he had been a part of his ministry for all those years. 30 pieces of silver. Think about that. And out of this comes addiction. Romans 7, 15 to 17. This is one of my favorite verses ever in the Bible. This is Paul describing what it's like to, to live in, in an addicted lifestyle. He says, I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I can't. I do what I don't want to, what I hate. I know perfectly well that what I'm doing is wrong, and my bad conscience proves that I agree with these laws, that I'm breaking. He felt guilty and shame because he would do things that were terrible, even though he knew it was wrong. But I can't help myself because I'm no longer doing it. Isn't that sound like a cop out? I can't help myself, guys, in these horrible addictions I have. Oh, because it's not me doing it. The devil made me do it, right? That comes from this verse in the Bible. It is sin inside me that is stronger than I am and makes me do these evil things. And I'm opining I'm, I'm telling you that that is absolutely the truth and without Jesus Christ in our lives without us clinging to the Holy Spirit we are not capable on our own to be able to fight these things these addictions will will chew us up and spit us out Satan will have his way with us if we don't cling close to the Holy Spirit I don't know how many of you think that you can march through this world alone and survive. I don't. I know for a fact that I can't. I have tried and I failed miserably. It was, it, the outcome was horrible. Now today, life is still a little tough sometimes, you know. I'm in quarantine and, and maybe that's not the worst because <clears throat> I have a little space to walk around. My wife is sick. It's scary to watch her go through these things. People are rioting and, and, and the economy's crashing and burning and, and everyone's getting sick and it's just, it's crazy out there. It's insane is what it is. And, and I don't believe that I could, I could handle this if I thought this all that was all there was. I believe the only way that we march through these things is we call upon the Holy Spirit. We call upon God's mercy in order to guide us and direct us in these times of trials and struggles. You know, Paul said, right? I can't quote the verse, but he said, hey, well, don't be surprised when these things fall upon you because this is the way of the world. And things that separate us from God. So it creates an addiction and it introduces these things that separate us from God. You know, I, I heard a preacher one time, it's really fascinating the way he explained this, but he said there were two sins. There's sin with a capital S and sins with a small s. And, and we could name all the sins, gambling and pornography and abuse and lying and stealing. And we can go through the Ten Commandments and we can talk about all the behaviors that are sinful. But he said that the difference was, was that sin, the big S, was our separation from God. And that that separation is what caused all the little sins to come about. So if you want to get rid of your sins, your sinful life, first get rid of the big sin. Draw closer to God. Look in the face of Jesus. Call upon the Holy Spirit. Put on the full armor of God. <clears throat> and the big sin will go away. And when that does, all the little sins disappear as well. Amen? Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. Um, in uh, Testimonies, Miss White writes this. She says, if we would be spiritual worshipers of Jesus Christ, we must sacrifice every idol and obey first the four, the, we obey the first four commandments. These allow no separation of the affections from God, nor is anything allowed to divide or share our supreme delight in him. Whatever divides the affections and takes away from the soul's supreme love to God assumes the form of an idol. It could be money or food or people or whatever. Our carnal hearts would cling to our idols and seek to carry them along, but we cannot advance 
<clears throat> until we put them away. For they separate us from God. The big sin, separation from God. And when that happens, all those other sinful behaviors become a part of our lives, a part of our character. In uh, Signs of the Times, um, it says, Would you judge of the lawlessness or the unlawlessness of a pleasure? Take this rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off the relish of spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of your body over your mind, that thing to you is sin. Wow, is that beautiful, right? John Wesley's mother writing to him when he was in college. How often do we ask that question? Well, what is sin? And is sin different for me than it is to you? It says it right here. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness, I'll put it on a first person, my conscience, obscures my sense of God, or takes off the relish of spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of my body over my mind, that thing to me is sin. Amen? So, <clears throat> you can't take it with you. 1 Timothy 6, 6, 16 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. So it doesn't mean that we can't have things in this world. We just have to be content with what we have while we're here. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, it's not, and this is often misquoted, it doesn't say the money is a root of all kinds of evil. It says for the love of money, and we can replace that for the love of anything besides God, is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith and their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You ever hear this expression? He who dies with the most toys wins. Well, I like this one better. He who dies with the most toys <laughs> still dies. So we have to be ready to give it up. Again, Matthew 19 to, to 21 says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In summary, the Savior, the, the Savior saw that men were absorbed in getting gain and were losing sight of eternal realities. Sounds like today, doesn't it? I mean, nothing different. Nothing new under the sun. <clears throat> he undertook to correct this evil. He sought to break the infatuating spell <clears throat> excuse me, that was paralyzing the soul. Lifting up his voice, he cried, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you do for $2 million? He presents before fallen humanity the nobler world they have lost sight of, that they may behold eternal realities. He takes them to the threshold of the infinite, flushed with the indescribable glory of God, and shows them the treasure there. The value of this treasure is above gold, it's above silver. The riches of earth mine, earth's mines cannot compare with it. Amen? We just have to be spend this week being content with what we have not wanting what other people have in fact giving away what we have to others who need it not being afraid to let go of it i think the the rich young ruler i think the problem he had they didn't say give me your stuff they said be willing to give it up are we willing to give up everything we have am i willing to give up my home my vehicles my possessions whatever am i willing to give it away if I'm so called upon by God to do so? And the answer better be yes, because if it's not, then whatever that possession is, is standing between me and God. It's getting in the way of that relationship. I'm putting, as Ms. White said, the authority of the body, or, or John Wesley's mind, the authority of the body above the authority of the mind, amen? 
Let's close with prayer. Ivracha Adonoi Vishmarecha, Yaar Adonoi Panavalecha Vikunecha Lis Adonoi Panavalecha Vyashamlecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, looking forward to seeing everybody next week. Uh, love you and miss you. And, um, and have a wonderful week.